Good morning, afternoon, or evening, folks, and welcome to Cast of All Trades. I'm your host, Orion Siebert, and in this episode, I sit down with John Erickson, a longtime friend of mine who has been learning about music composition for the past year. We discuss everything from the foundational knowledge you'll need for composing, to John's rough process from start to finish of taking a piece from an idea in his head to sheet music down on paper. Hey, John, it's a pleasure to bring you onto the show. How have you been? Hey, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I've been pretty good, actually. School's taken a good sort of, you know, run around, and I'm on top of things, as one should expect to be. Um, other than that, like, that's the most excitement I usually get, so no complaints. Well, fair enough. I guess without further ado, let's just dive right into it. So tell me a bit about your story how why and when did you start dabbling with music as a whole Oof. we're talking about music as a whole that's that's a bit of a long story um try to make this as concise as possible without too much rambling um back when i was a kid i'd uh i'd go to church you know um and i had a really nice close-knit uh, relationship with my grandmother and just so happens that the church that we went to she was the organist at um when it came to church of course children are squirrely want to be near people that they know and all that and i always sat with my grandma at the organ um uh, you know fun memories you get to see how the music works how it comes out how the person does it and you get to munch on cough drops as if they're candy um all of that sort of just childhood wonder kind of culminated into, I want to do this. So I uh, bothered my mother at the time to, you know, get me into piano lessons. I needed to learn how to play a keyboard. I wanted to be just like my grandma, and I wanted to get all of that sort of through. And after a good amount of childish heckling, I actually succeeded. Um, life continued. I stayed close with my grandma, but I've gotten adopted a few times since then. And I found a second sort of musical family in high school with band, well, middle school first. Um, but I didn't consider myself a clarinet player until high school. Um, that's when my interest in music kind of went from a, I want to do that to a, I really want this to be my life. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so you started off with, like, sort of absorbed by the organ, and I've never actually heard, thinking back, I don't know if I've ever heard of a kid pestering their family about, hey, I want to learn how to play the piano, I want to learn how to play music. It's always, in my mind, it's always been the other way around, where it's the parents trying to drag the kids kicking and screaming over to, like, you're going to go to piano lessons now, or you're going to learn this musical instrument because I wanted to do that like as a kid, but I never got to. So I'm pushing that onto you. Oh, yeah, not at all with me. I was an absolute menace. Um, <laughs> Grandma and I would listen to Beethoven and Chopin quite often, and it was just the greatest thing I ever knew. And it, like, it made me happy. I wanted to make other people happy the same way. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, over the years... As you've been sort of learning how to learning how to play, it's, I feel like, in my personal opinion, before you can start writing music, it's important to know how to listen to it, how to play it. Uh, what were like, I guess what I'm sort of getting at is what were some of the things that you learned over those years of like just learning how to play and learning how to listen to music. What were what were some things that really stood out to you from that? Mm. I've never, not until recently, have I particularly learned how to listen to music. Um, if we're talking about in sort of a understanding music, performative sort of sense, uh, playing music and listening to music kind of developed around the same time. With piano, when I was a kid, it was basically just hitting the keys in a way that sounded nice. But when I got into a high school band, 
Um, one thing that was very much so stressed is that when you're playing, you're not listening to yourself. You're listening from somebody across the room in a different section of the band from you, and you're making sure that your sounds go well together. And really, um, I don't think that's necessarily a required aspect of listening to music. Um, I just want to note. Um, but for performance and writing music, absolutely. Because that's how you learn how sound interacts with each other. That's how you learn basically what makes the pretty noise other than what is the pretty noise. Did, did that answer? Um, kind of, I think. To try to re to try to bounce that back off of you. So uh listening to music, it's less about listening to yourself as you're playing and trying to hear yourself. It's more of in your case, as you were working with a full band and occasionally a full band and orchestra, it's listening yeah. to the instruments around you to, well, to figure out where do I place in this piece, in this whole ensemble? Am I sort of getting that right? Yeah, in the in the performative sense, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to just casually listening to music, there's no correct answer. However, it makes you happy is the best way to do it. Mm -hmm. I would agree with you there. So sort of bringing us back to what uh, the show is a bit more about. So over the years, uh, what have been some of the skills that you've developed that have helped most with your music or well, composing music? Skills that have been both kind of on the expected side and maybe some of the unexpected skills that have been surprisingly helpful. Oh, uh, this is an answer that starts tangentially. Uh, All right. I dropped out of college in 2018. My mindset wasn't in the right spot. I wasn't ready for school, myriad reasons, thousand excuses, etc. Mm -hmm. um, and really, during that like four-ish year period, I kind of divorced myself from music. And though I definitely regret it, it might not have been a particularly bad idea because I, I worked job to job. I did kind of a jack of all trades thing. Um, and then I realized, no, I want to go back to school. But uh, when I went back to school, I decided I wanted to be a history major, a public history major specifically. But given my music training, the fact that I'd have to declare a minor, it seemed obvious I'd still take the music minor. Um, when I got back to school, uh, the resource that has really helped me has been my uh, clarinet professor, um, previously my advisor. Um, she really, really set me into being a music major. Um, she wanted me to double major because she understood she wasn't going to sway me out of history. Um, but... Doing that double major has been the most unexpected and, in hindsight, most welcome thing that I needed. Um, just just having that sort of exposure to music, in, in that case, whether I liked it or not, um, did wonders to the point where I am where I am now. Um, I'm sorry, can you ask the one one question again? I think I got lost in the tangent just a little bit. No, it's all good. And to quickly clarify, uh, back in 2018, before you dropped out of college, you were studying, uh, was it clarinet at the time? Uh, clarinet, yes. Every okay. music major, despite your major, requires an instrumental focus. I was specifically going for music education. I was wanting to be a high school band teacher. Okay, just wanted to quickly clarify that first. So... Yeah, I just think about some of the some of the skills that you've sort of developed over the years that have helped you most with composing music, both expected and unexpected. Ah, yes. Um, so getting back into college there um, and having that sort of back into the music major moment. Um, one of the classes that we have to take, well, it's part of our lessons. Every week we have to go to our instrumental studio, uh, as I have a clarinet focus, that's with the other clarinets, um, and convocation, which is a once per week meeting, typically on Fridays here, that uh, 
basically all the music majors in the school just get together, talk about music, and perform for each other. And I think one thing that really helped me in every aspect of my musical life was, for lack of a better term, being forced to listen to different kinds of music. Um, it's very easy to find your favorite type of music and stay in that lane forever. But if you can open your mind to listening to just about anything, there's so much that you can learn about performing, about writing, about even just listening and how you listen. Um, and really just being thrown into that atmosphere where I'd be listening to, I don't know, vocal quartet or a cappella choir. Uh, magical dinners are a thing that NDSU uh, has every year, and that was an experience. Um, if you don't listen typically to trumpet concertos or anything like that, it's, I cannot stress enough. Just listen to stuff that you don't think you're interested in. Chances are it has something for you. All right. Um, uh, could you give me sort of an example of music that you might, well, that you might normally listen to and then how like a piece that maybe doesn't fit that normal framework, how you listen to that and you got something from it? Yeah. Um, I generally, the, the ironic part about how I'm studying clarinet is I've never really been particularly interested in solo clarinet music. Um, when it comes to the genre of art music, my focus usually goes into like symphonic winds, full bands, uh, wind ensembles, wind symphonies, even full orchestras. Um, I went to a recital that my clarinet professor was uh, doing last year, last February, I think. Um, and it's just not generally my thing, but I went because, you know, it was my advisor, it was my clarinet instructor, it was someone big and important that I needed to go to the recital of. And she played a piece called Homage uh, the Faya. It was an homage to a famous uh, Spanish composer written for solo clarinet. And I listened to it, no accompaniment, just the one clarinet. Generally, no chords, multiphonics are a thing, but that's a whole different conversation. Just one tone, what can it do? And I was blown away. I decided I needed to make something that sounded Spanish. Um, I learned about the Phrygian scale, I learned about Spanish instrumentation, and I ended up writing something that sounded more spaghetti western. So you get a little bit of irony out of that, but if it were not for listening to that one piece that I, in like any other scenario, probably would never have been exposed to, I would have not made 10 minutes of music. Wow, awesome. So from from what I'm gathering from listening to you, for sure, one of the big skills that has helped you along the way is being able to listen to another piece, whether that's something that you would normally listen to or something that is totally out of your ballpark, and just learning how to nitpick little pieces, little parts of it, to be able to like listen into it and perhaps uh, identify some different aspects of a piece that a casual listener might not be able to normally pick up on. Is that... Yes. Some... Okay. Awesome. Um, for more expected skills, of course, uh, basic music theory is going to be a must. Uh, in short, you should know how tonic works, leading tones, scales. It, it helps you make a melody, and then it helps you harmonize the melody. Um, I don't really have too much to add on that because it's kind of a thing that's been said a thousand times in a thousand ways, but I cannot stress how important that is as well. Mm -hmm. I would 100% agree with that. And do you have any, do you have any tips or recommendations for someone if they're learning music theory for the first time, have never touched it, like I want to make my first piece, music theory, everyone says, I got to learn that. Do you have any recommended yeah. like tools or places that someone might want to look at? Well, if you're doing it the way that I did it through college, then uh, if you're listening to this, you're in college right now and you are early in your career. 
take notes, take all the notes, take every note, everything that they say, try to absorb it all and try to just become an expert on the fundamentals as you're learning. But if you are wholesale, fully new to music, trying to learn this stuff, um, approach it like you're learning a different language. Um, how have I heard it before? I mean, some of the way musical phrases work out are literally called sentence structure. Um, learn what predominant dominant means and then learn what a scale is and what that means in kind of a linguistic sense rather than a musical sense. If you can think of it that way, the rest of it should come to you pretty easily. All right. Fair enough. So yeah, if you're in college, definitely take advantage of what professors are just telling you and handing out to you. But perhaps for people who aren't in college or don't have the time or resources to do that, maybe picking up some old uh, piano books or some beginner, like just some uh, beginner books for a general music instrument or might be a good place to start or some simple YouTube, uh, like YouTube lessons might be a good place to start. I'd say sooner the YouTube lessons. Beginner uh, piano books are nice, but um, sometimes they just really throw you in there, especially if you don't know what you're looking for. So a lot of them is just kind of assume that you already know what a scale is and how to read your staff and key signatures. Um, definitely starting with instructional videos or uh, doing a little bit of research and uh, normal reading first would be a good way to go. All right, fair enough. Uh, and one last thing about the skills thing I want to nail down with you is, were there any unexpected skills that you have developed over the years that as you were writing your first piece or just learning about music composition that you thought, wow, uh, I never thought this skill would be useful in this, but here it is. Improvisation. Um... Don't take this as like you need to understand the whole uh, thing about like reading a lead sheet and being a perfect jazz improviser. But I get stuck in writing melodies um, often. And the, the thing that usually gets me out of it is being able to just sit at the piano for a minute and just kind of play a couple notes in a way that sounds nice, kind of based off of whatever baseline information I know about the piece, about piano, and about uh, theory in general. Um, and just don't think, just play something that you think will sound good, see how it fits into what you're doing, and uh, go from there. It has stopped many roadblocks in my way, and like I said, I never thought I was going to be an improviser. So it's not that impressive of a thing, but it was wholly unexpected to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Sometimes you just need to play an instrument, not not just in the musical sense of play, but in the like childlike sense of play, where you are sitting down and just sort of having fun with it, and something may come out of it. Am I sort of getting that right? Yeah, the the term that I usually use is uh, banging it out. I'm banging out a melody right now. I'm trying to figure something out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's awesome. So moving into sort of a somewhat different topic, but kind of similar, uh, what were some of the challenges that you faced while composing some of your first or early pieces? And what were some of those lessons that you learned along the way from it? The hardest challenge to starting writing music is to start writing music. Um, if you had asked me literally a year ago if I were a composer, I would say no. Absolutely not. I don't know what I'm doing. I have no idea what's going on. I've written stuff for theory class. That is it. Um, that's kind of been my thought on the subject for as long as I can remember. I'll never write music. I'll never do that. But um, I just started. And it was not easy. Um how do I describe this? My my fiance uh, and I play D and D together. Um, we just finished a uh, big campaign that I was running, but she got the clever idea in her head. Now that I'm back at college and studying music, um, she basically said, "I I do all this art. I do all this drawing. Why don't you write 
a theme for my character. And I said the same thing that I usually say. It's like, no, I can't write music. I'll never be a composer. She just said, try it. So I did. And then I took composition lessons the next semester. Granted, the next semester was a week later, but I signed up for composition lessons. I wanted to know what I was doing. I wanted to see if I could be any good at it. And the composition instructor basically said, we still have openings in our uh, composition recital this semester. This will fit in nicely if you'd like to do it. And then after that, everything just kind of changed. People liked the piece of music that I wrote and I started calling myself a composer. So really the, the hardest part of it is just starting it. I would 100% agree. There's an idea that I'm sort of workshopping that I loosely call activation energy or overcoming activation em energy, where it's an idea in chemistry that if you want to get a chemical reaction to start, oftentimes it's, you have to have all the chemical ingredients that are there that's your preparation to do the thing. And then there's some level of like some level of activation energy that you have to put in to say, okay, I got everything here, but now I just have to push just a little bit more. And then everything after there suddenly just, it just happens whether you want it to or not. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And after that, people around the stool or school started calling me a composer. Um, I had no intentions of becoming a composition major. Um, I was, was still a clarinet, and I was kind of irritated, but it's just that push. It's all it is. Mm -hmm. and oftentimes, the number one thing that stops people from going out and accomplishing some great thing or doing something awesome is that they never actually start. And I can't tell you how many times I've heard of people saying, oh, yeah, I'm going to go and do this really cool thing. But then... Like they're, they get so busy with uh, like analysis by paralysis, way too much research, like, oh yeah, so gung-ho about this. And for months, sometimes upwards of years, they will say, yes, I'm going to go do this awesome thing. I've been researching it. I've been preparing myself. And they do all this prep and all this research. Sometimes they even throw a bunch of money at it where they get all the best gear and then they never do anything with it. Mm-hmm. They get all their chemical supplies built up, in fact, way too much, more than they'll ever need. And then they don't push the button. They don't flick the switch. They don't put in that little bit of activation energy. In my mind, if you can get over the first, like if you can do two to three minutes, and like if you can do something for two to three minutes, that's all the activation energy you need to just snowball into working on something for hours at a time perhaps yeah and um kind of jumping off of that the the research paralysis and all that if any of you are listening and are considering writing music um when i wrote my first piece i was just done with my first semester of theory and that that covers time signatures that covers uh scales that covers some voice leading a little bit of counterpoint just so you kind of know your do's and don'ts of how to voice lead in the 17th century and basic harmonizations so just the basic one four five one chord pattern that you see everywhere um write something from there see how it sounds you don't need to get anything too fancy with like german six or neapolitans or uh, other strange predominance like that just just go for it mm -hmm. I would absolutely agree. Uh, I've also done a little bit of dabbling with composing in the past. Certainly nothing nothing as good as what I've heard of your music. I'll be honest, before uh, we were started recording this, I was working on some notes for this episode, and I just had your music on in the background, and I was jamming out to it. I For a while, I just forgot, like, oh yeah, my, my friend wrote this, and not some, like, not some super professional composer who's been doing this for years and years and years. And I thought to myself, wow, I know some guys who can write some really cool music. And it was, it was awesome to just sit down and work on this episode, listening to your stuff. Thank you. I'm flattered. Mm -hmm. So anyways, bringing this, uh, sort of bringing this back to uh, some of the other challenges you may have faced while composing your first pieces. Is there anything else that comes to mind of, like, oh, yeah, well, there was this, there might have been that, but 
Anything else that comes to mind of challenges you may have faced composing some of your earlier works? Yeah, um, I got stuck in a groove. Um, I kind of found a melody and I stuck with it. Um, the, the first piece that I wrote, uh, it's called The Shadow of Mercy. I have it on uh, YouTube and my website right now, titled under excerpt from Shadow of Mercy. I can get more into that later if you'd like, but um, <laughs> pardon me. Uh, I got a decent way into it, and I got to a point where I thought, I need to make an ending. Everything has run its course, but I do not know how to change the mood here. Um, and that was extremely tough. Um, and the way that I wrote the piece, there was not going to be a good answer on how to conclude it. And I brought it to my composition instructor there, and he said, yeah, you kind of made things very much centered around this motif. It's going to be hard to get out of it. And ultimately, what we came up with was that we just bring back the beginning of the piece um, and just kind of let it end. And it's not, it's not really the solution that I'm most proud of, but it was a solution. So it's 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 a very real problem to get stuck in a groove like something too much and not let yourself kind of flow from there. Mm -hmm. And I think you hit on something else real really important as part of that. Two things actually that come to mind. One is that uh, you ran into a problem and you went to other people for help with it. You didn't just sit and stew with your problem for a while. Think. Mm, what can I do about this? Mm, uh, uh. You didn't just sit and start groaning for a while, or maybe you did until you eventually brought well, brought your problem to someone who had more experience. Like That's something that I rarely ever hear people doing, where, I don't know, it's just not something I hear about often, but it's a really good, real solution that people have. Like There's almost certainly someone around you that has more information than you do, or is more experienced in something than you are. So why not go ask them for advice? Go ask them for help. Indeed. Um, like, I've been doing this for about a year now. I, I can still be considered new to this. Um, but with the experience that I have, I still go to my professor for help with things. Like, that's kind of the whole relationship of, you know, mentor-mentee. But I should assure that just because you get help in writing something does not make it any less yours. Mm -hmm. I would absolutely agree with that. And the second point I wanted to bring up from your story is that uh, you said that you weren't happy, not necessarily happy with your solution to it. I think it's very important to point out that you are a beginner at this, and even if the solution isn't perfect, a solution is a solution. And it's one step closer to like, oh, this is better. Like it's one step further from like the next piece can be a little bit better. The next one can be a little bit better. And it's not always about getting the perfect answer every single time or getting what's in your head exactly out onto the page. Sometimes it is just, I really like this motif. Well, at least from the sounds of it is, you really liked that motif, and that permeated the entire piece. And while it was an interesting motif, it almost became domineering to it, and you couldn't divert, you couldn't change it all that much. And it sort of bogged down everything else, and you could have kept on trying to brute force it until eventually maybe you would have gotten something quote-unquote perfect. But instead, you decided, one, going to get some help to get this figured out, and two, get a solution that's good enough so you can say, yeah, I did this. I have one, one under the belt. That's one piece of paper on the stack that I can say, I did that. I made that. That's a win right there. And you can keep on building from there. Yes. And uh, one thing that I want to add to that is uh, why I now call it the excerpt uh, uh, from Shadow of Mercy because um, that is how it's labeled on my website and my YouTube, but I usually just call it the Shadow of Mercy because that was its original name. Um, I, like I said, I wasn't too happy with the ending. It was functional. It worked, and it makes for what I believe is a good piece of music. But 
music is especially when you're writing it a very personal journey and i'm a very stubborn person so i kind of i i released that as it is and i have resolved that as i get more musical knowledge i'm going to come back to it and i'm going to finish it the way that i think that i want to finish it not the way that it needed to be done at the time that's awesome you know have a like you have a bar to shoot towards to say do i have the skills to make this into what i want it to be yet exactly yeah that's that's super cool okay uh are there any other uh challenges that you face that you want to bring up or do you want to move on to a bit of a different question um those were kind of my big two challenges starting out so if we want to move on we certainly can yeah sure uh how, how has <laughs> learning to play pieces like how is learning to play music differed from writing music Ooh, um, they're not as different as you think. All right. Um, because as you're, okay, writing and playing kind of go hand in hand. Um, the more you learn to play, the more you learn to write. Um, there's, of course, different techniques you will learn for each of them. But there's a reason why, uh, at least here at NDSU, <laughs> There's a stress that composers have to learn the piano and have to learn an instrument. Um, part of comp composition is just playing. Um, your listening skills are going to basically be the same, but now instead of listening while you're playing, you're listening to what you're writing and how everything interlocks with itself um, in essence. There's between the two basically equivalent uh, knowledge on theory. You really can't be uh, an extraordinary player without having a very good understanding of theory, um, how music works with itself, and how you can then manipulate the uh, emotion within a piece as a performer rather than just as a writer. Um, this is not an easy question. Yeah, that's, um, that's fair. Yeah. It... The simple answer would be they're more similar than you think to more get at the differences, which, if I'm not mistaken, is more what you were asking about. Mm -hmm. um, you're learning a lot of technical skill playing an instrument uh, for a clarinet, for instance, I have to learn my embouchure, how to hold my jaw, where my tongue should be in my mouth, um, how what fingers cover what holes when and where you don't have to worry about that with writing. Um, I use MuseScore presently. I'm thinking of upgrading pretty soon here, but you don't have to know any of that while you're writing. It certainly makes it easier, but writing is definitely more on the theoretical side. How does this work? Does it sound nice? What can I do after this? All right. Uh, as you were talking a bit about some of the similarities in, uh, in particular with listening, as you were describing that, it reminded me what you were talking about when you were, when you were talking about playing in a playing in a band or in a full ensemble, where uh, learning how to write music from the way that you described it. Tell me if I'm wrong here, but the way that you were listening to things, uh, it seems a bit more like learning how to listen to a band or learning how to listen in a, playing a band, as opposed to just listening to yourself play where both of them will require listening skills but when it comes to writing learning how to listen to yourself in the context of like how everything fits together seems more like what you were talking about earlier on with listening while you're playing in a band or in an ensemble oh yes i i've definitely taken the listening to in an ensemble uh mindset into composition because uh one thing that i do when I'm writing is I will isolate two instruments and I'll just see how they interact with each other. And then I'll keep doing that until I've gone through every combination possible. Um, because you're not performing while you're writing. It's just you listening. And it's, you know, very easy to do that listen for fun thing. But keeping the mindset that if you're making a piece for an ensemble, especially, um, when it reaches a live ensemble to play, they're going to be that, doing that ensemble listening. And 
when you can think of writing in that way, everything just sounds a little bit smoother too. So you're making it easier for the performers, you're making it easier for yourself, and you're hopefully making something that sounds good. Yeah, awesome. So were there any other key differences that you noticed between learning to play, well, between playing instruments and playing music versus writing it? Well, I mean, I suppose in a sense, there's a lot less pressure to write music. Um, if you're performing music, you're probably doing it live. People are probably watching you and that can get rather stressful. But in most, like 99% of my writing music, I do it alone with headphones on. Nobody else is hearing what I'm doing. It's just me. And if I don't like something, nobody has to hear it. So a lot of the pressure that comes with it is alleviated. You feel more confident. Or at least I feel more confident while I'm writing. Um, but then there's that next step of, hey, I wrote this thing that I really like and I'm really proud of. I really hope you like it because I put a lot of emotion into this and now this is the most stressful moment of my life. Mm -hmm. So there's just, just give and take. It sounds like you're uh, spacing out the the stress and the anxiety from like playing versus uh, like, well, performing versus writing where the performing aspect of like stress and trying to deal with that is all in the performance of itself where like if you mess up, it's like okay. Like there's some technical things there, but it's not your music. It's you're often playing someone else's thing. You're like uh, performing to recreate someone else's music, and if you mess up on that or people aren't so happy with it, it's like eh, okay. There's there's some things about that that feel it feels a bit more accepting to be, or it feels a bit less stressful if that makes sense. And then compare that with writing your own music it's almost you almost have a sense of perfectionism to it where like sure you can like you can work on this thing as long as you want but that's a double-edged sword where you can work on a piece as long as you want and there isn't necessarily a deadline to go with it and when you eventually do let put that out into the world for people to say or people to listen to then the criticisms the criticisms of it might feel a bit more personal where it might be that someone doesn't like the piece in itself, but it, it might almost feel like, oh, this person's attacking me, not the piece, or is am I sort of on the right track with that? Yeah, uh, mostly. On the, the instrumental side is uh, the bit. It, it, it's just how the stress and when the stress happens that's different, because it's fairly equivalent in my instance, just... When you're performing, everything's done live, and you basically have one chance to get things right for the audience, and that's immensely stressful in the moment. Mm -hmm. Whereas when you're writing music, nobody's looking at the live. Nobody's going to see what you do behind the scenes unless you show them. You don't have to show them. All the stress comes when you then release it to the world. Um, that, that makes the process of writing music so much easier than performing in my, in my mind. Because if I don't like something, who has to know? Mm -hmm. So perhaps it's just more of a, it's a more controlled form of stress when you're writing compared to when you're playing. Exactly. Okay. So I know you've touched on this a little bit, uh, but tell me a bit about some of the methods and tools you've, you, you use while composing or what you might have used like when you were first doing it, if you're still using similar tools or not. Wow, that was a yeah. really poor way to put that question, but no, I know what you, you mean. Don't no worry about it. Yeah, uh, there's a lot of tools. There's plenty of tools you can use. I use MuseScore um, to write, uh, to notate, and it's a like on the literal meaning of like a physical tool. MuseScore is pretty nice. It's free. Anyone can use it. Um, I've been. I was using it. I still am using it because I'm broke. But I was using it as kind of a introductory thing. Um, anyone can use it. That's the end point of that. But when you're putting notes on the page, you can hear what note you place, and then you can press play, and then it'll play it back for you in kind of a semi-realistic AI rendition of instruments being played. 
um, being able to hear what you write in real time, incredibly useful. But when it comes to writing itself, having that basic theory knowledge is an incredible tool. You know where your leaning tone goes. You know uh, how all of your other notes are supposed to resolve. That can save you a lot of time, so you're not just fumbling on the staff. Um, you know about dominance and predominance. You can set up any sentence that you want musically. Um, basic theory, incredible tool, massive time saver. Um, listening, like I said, just listening to all sorts of music is my biggest recommendation by far. Um, when I wrote my first thing, when I wrote Shadow of Mercy, um, my fiance challenged me and said, because she was taking a very art approach to it, um, base it off of this. And what she said to base it off of was John Williams. And I immediately panicked because if anyone could be John Williams, there would be no John Williams. That's kind of been my philosophy on it. And for um, clarification, who is John Williams? Uh, I have no idea. He made that Star Wars movie, I think. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, no, John Williams is an incredibly popular American composer. Um, he did Star Wars, uh, Harry Potter, Indiana Jones, Superman, E.T., The Extraterrestrial, uh, The Olympics, so much more. Incredibly famous, incredibly talented, uh, wonderful person. So music and that maybe, uh, you know, maybe one or two people might have heard of. Got it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we had just gotten off of a, a small Star Wars kick. We had uh, watched all the original trilogy again for New Year's. Um, we were watching Star Wars Rebels at the time, and she was like, "I well, we like Star Wars music. Just base your music off of John Williams. And like that is probably not going to be as easy as it sounds, but I took it seriously. Um, Star Wars The Last Jedi. Everybody's favorite Star Wars movie. Uh, sarcasm. Non-compliant. Um, the trailer for it had been stuck in my head since it came out in 2017. Um, where it's got this fun sort of chemiolic uh, 6, 8, 3, 4 clash going against itself. And I decided, I want to use that. I really like the sound of that. So that became the starting step to my uh, to Shadow of Mercy. Um, it's not one-to-one. -one. I wouldn't want it to be one-to-one. -one. Uh, plagiarism is bad, kids. Remember that. Um and then I just kind of riffed on the melody from the 6-8 instance that I took. Um, just listen to music. It is the greatest inspiration. Um, and it's very, very evident what your influences are, something that I have uh, learned as a composer. So lean into your influences. Don't try to make something new, because musically, you're probably not. Mm -hmm. I love I love this quote and I can never remember who said it or exactly how the quote goes but plagiarism is when you steal from one person and art is when you steal from many people and put it together yes yes you're like an artist mm -hmm. um one that my composition instructor has told me is uh the act the art of becoming a good composer is just being better at hiding your influences mm-hmm yeah. So you touch on us a little bit of sources for inspiration. And I sort of want to, well, first of all, what have been some of the best sources of inspiration for you in composing? Uh, clearly, Star Wars and Indiana Jones and a lot of the movies that you've watched have been good influences on you. And I can tell from listening to some of your stuff, I want to bet that Lord of the Rings is the, is in there as well. Because Actually... Yes, but not the Lord of the Rings you're thinking of. I can get back to that later if you'd like. Okay. Um, my primary inspirations, uh, I love Star Wars. John Williams is, like, the greatest American composer ever. I'm sorry, Aaron Copeland fans. I get it. Um, I, yeah, everything he does has been great, but I, I draw my inspiration from kind of everywhere. 
uh, when I said your inspirations are obvious, it's because I wrote a few more pieces after that. And all three pieces that I wrote as of that time got the same reaction of, wow, you really like The Legend of Zelda, don't you? And it's fun because these people did not know that I am probably the largest Zelda fan in the school of music here. Um, so Koji Kondo and Toru Minigishi are great inspirations of mine. I have been playing The Legend of Zelda since I was like 12 or 13. Um, it's just my favorite series of anything ever, and it would not make sense for my music to not be inspired by it. Mm -hmm. So when you're looking for inspiration, it's often just in the media that you like to consume. Am I sort of getting that right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and that, that goes for anything. It's not just video games or movies. It's also music that you listen to. Um, it could be the way that you walk down the street. You hear the footsteps pattering, and that's rhythm that you like. Really, just the music that you have consumed through the years will bleed into the back of your mind. And that's going to be your inspiration, whether you know it or not. Mm -hmm. And what about when you're actively looking for like a, uh, a, a source of inspiration for you to use? For example, as you were talking about with the excerpt uh, from The Shadow of Mercy, uh, you were focused on this trailer from Star Wars. And essentially what I want to sort of dig into here is walk me a bit through your process of like finding finding melodies or finding things that you want to have central to your composing what does that sort of look like going from start to finish kind of walk me through that process there yeah um this is probably going to be the hardest question to answer because quite frankly i barely know what my process is and that's um, just fine it all starts with an idea. That's that's basically the the wrap it up. We're, we're good. It all starts with an idea. No. Um, with The Shadow of Mercy, all of my music until uh, my most recent one, Return Me Home to Frost, Laid in Trees, um, it's all been based off of d d in a way. Um, I'm a dungeon master. I DM. I like making stories, and I like reacting and seeing how the characters react to my stories. So when I was starting to write, I focused on characters in my D&D campaign, and it started with the concept of, if this character had a theme, what would it be? Um, much to my fiance's challenge. Uh, when she wanted a theme based off of her character and mentioned... Uh, John Williams, The Last Jedi was the first thing that really came to my mind because the the trailer theme from it, um, the, the motif that's used in the trailer theme is also played in the spark in the official soundtrack. Um, it's, it's heavy, it's uh, daunting, it's conflicted. And those are three words that I would use to describe uh, what her character was like. Um, and I just kind of went from there with that one and kind of riffed off of it. And I didn't really have a process for my first piece. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Pardon me. Um, for the next one I did, though, The Emissary of Hope, um, that was based off of another one of my friend's characters, a kind of monastic uh, desert dweller who uh, just wants to do right in the world. And this comes off of... Uh, as I mentioned earlier, my clarinet professor's recital where she played the homage to Faya, um, I wanted to write something Spanish. And sometime around the same time, I remember seeing uh, or something around the same time, I remember seeing a video that kind of broke down how uh, Ocarina of Time's Gerudo Valley is Spanish inspired in its instrumentation. Um, I was like, okay, I really like this uh, video, the sort of Moorish uh, influence that permeated uh, this track, uh, the fun instrumentation. Maybe I'll do the Desert Dweller based off of the Moors and the Spanish instead of what most people would do, like Arabic or Middle Eastern sort of sitar uh, kind of sounds. 
All right. And I basically took the Moorish type of the, the the Spanish type of instrumentation for like flamenco. Just so happens that it's a very similar instrumentation to uh, Gerudo Valley. Um, and I wanted to see how those instruments would react to each other. I had a weird echo thing going on between the flute and the trumpet where it was kind of call and response. But um, really, I just kind of dug into what makes Spanish music Spanish. How is the guitar played? I'm not good at writing guitar. If you've ever tried to play my guitar part, I apologize. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's really just getting that idea thinking about how you want to execute that idea. Um, I don't know how to best describe it, honestly. It's just... I think thing. I can pick it up from here. So from what you were talking about, I, I'm i starting to piece together an analogy of a painter where before a painter starts painting a picture, they often start with making their palette. They'll start by picking out a few colors, or in your case, it might be picking out a few key elements of a piece for an uh, excerpt, uh, excerpt from The Mercy of Shadow, it was picking out, like, I want this time signature, I want this key, I want this motif to be the main thing. This is going to be my main color for this painting, for this piece of music. And then I, th I feel like you described it quite well as you moved into uh, the Emissary of Hope piece, where you were talking about your process of, like, this is who the character is. They're a desert dwelling do gooder that's what they want to be so as part of that you like you actually went out and researched you went in and did some research to figure out what what are some motifs that work well with this kind of music that i want to do or how is this kind of music actually done it wasn't you didn't just sit down and sort of fiddle away and, and experiment with it and hope that something would turn out the other end you actively took time to go out and see what is it that makes Spanish music Spanish? Is it in the type of music, the type of instruments that are being done? Are there certain rhythms? Are there certain patterns that are common in Spanish themes that I could use, or stuff like that? And in that way, you're going through and almost creating your own musician's uh, painter's palette, where you're finding a few key ideas that you can come back to to say, okay. If I want a piece to be Spanish, if I want a piece to be more like a uh, groovy, fun loving, then I know I need like I need this color paint, I need this color paint, I need this color paint, I need this kind of brush, I need these kind of things. It's almost going through and laying out your tools ahead of time. Yes. So just based on how you described it, that's sort of the image that I'm getting in my head. Am I sort of on the right track there? Yeah, that's that's exactly right. Actually, um, scales. Uh, that's the kind of the whole palette thing that I forgot to mention there. Um, did the obvious thing: happier characters, their scales are going to lean more mi or major. Um, Emissary hopes actually kind of a standout in that regard because it's kind of more Phrygian based, which is more minor, but that's the Spanish part of it. But going into uh, going into Shadow of Mercy, I knew it needed to be in a minor key because the character is kind of that moodier, more serious um, sort of deal. With Bedouin of Worms, that was a almost like offensively jovial, very upbeat character. And I was like, I got to do this whole thing in major. It's just the nature of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's awesome. That. That makes a lot of sense to me where uh, an idea that I feel like a lot of people tend to ignore is the idea of setting guidelines or setting boundaries and that having certain restrictions can often spawn greater creativity where in these pieces, I feel like you set some restrictions for yourself where it was like my, well, for example, my restriction is I want to make a theme for this character. Therefore, the restrictions are going to be, it has to sound like a Spanish piece. It has to use X, Y, Z, other, like, well, other uh, melodies or instruments or themes or harmonies. And by setting those restrictions, you're almost able to flourish more with being more creative since you might be working with things you might not normally be doing. 
Well, not just in that aspect, too. I think setting restrictions is a very good idea, especially when starting out, because music is an extremely big world. There's a lot of different ways you can do it. You should probably start small. Mm -hmm. Yeah, start with maybe like a 20 to 30 second little piece. Start, start with a few bits and pieces here and there, some trial runs, and work your way up sort of along that lines yeah and a piano is a very good place to start for that if you're looking at writing mm -hmm. one instrument like up to eight voices if you hate your pianist um it's it's a good place to start on just simple 30 second things mm -hmm. and speaking of starting we're gonna wrap this back around to yeah the beginner someone who doesn't know anything so Gonna gonna frame this for you. So I know nothing about music and composing, and I have a piece of music in my head that I want to compose. I want to get it on this piece of paper. What recommendations would you have to help me go from nothing to composing my first piece? Oh, that's a good question. Um, how do you have it stuck in your head? Have you tried playing it on the piano, or is it just an idea in your brain? Just an idea in my brain. Like I said, I know nothing about music and composing. I could probably hmm. sing or hum bits and pieces of it. Let's go with that. I'd say that your best uh, bet would uh, start by getting help. Uh, maybe a, a, a scribe, get it written down. Um, if you want to do it wholly independent, then you're probably going to have to learn your basic theory. You're going to want to do some ear training as well, which ties into theory. Uh, identifying intervals, uh, scales, etc. Um, that's stuff that I still struggle with too. Just getting something from my head onto a piece of paper. It's honestly not the easiest way to write. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would I would agree with you there. Like as someone who has also played piano for, like, gosh, I want to say I'm going on 15, 16 years now. You know, after, like, I feel like after year 10 or 11, you just stop counting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, even, like, I also have that problem of, oh, I have this idea in my head. I know how to play piano, but it's still so hard to get it from brain to keys. But I, I would agree with you. For someone who knows absolutely nothing about music and composing, a good first step would probably be, one, start studying theory. Yes. Go do some YouTube courses. There's probably a few playlists on YouTube that'll get you started. And from there, I love your idea of go get go get help from someone. Like they don't have to be a like professional musician. Like if they can play a bit of piano and you can like if you can hum and start singing little bits and pieces of the songs that you have in your head. Like if they can get the first note, it's often just if you can get to the first note, it becomes so much easier. Because you can slowly work your way through, just trial and error getting those intervals. Yes. And and that's one of the reasons why I brought up the piano earlier, is if you can get your idea on a piano, uh, there exists programs where you can play your idea on a piano uh, and have it recorded, and then it'll be quantized and shoved into sheet music. Um, that's actually one of my goals soon, is to get a small kind of MIDI connective uh piano to just let me compose a little bit faster um mm -hmm. there's tools out there absolutely so i feel like that i feel like that covers a key portion of this interview so why not move on to some more fun bonus questions for you sure so a bit more about you john what are some of your favorite pieces you know that is Definitely the hardest question that you can ask a musician. Um, but luckily, I was a little prepared for you to ask me that. All right. Oh, so if we're going to go into sort of like the world of art music, um, frankly, not my favorite term, but I, I, I listen to a lot of wind band repertoire because that's kind of how I've identified as a musician for so long. Um, and I play a lot of wind band repertoire thanks to uh, playing for wind symphony in college. 
and my favorite band piece and it's it's also arranged for full orchestra too so good good news for all the string players out there is johan de may's symphony number no. one the lord of the rings uh... it is not based on the movies in any sort of way howard shore had nothing to do with it the may wrote the symphony back in i want to say the 80s based solely off the books and uh how he pictured the characters and every part of it is just magnificent it's perfection mm -hmm. um more less known wind band stuff that i like i really like uh victoriano valencia rincon's suite number no. two um if you haven't heard that chances are you haven't go ahead give it a listen it's great stuff Otherwise, uh, when band influences are like Frank DeKelly or John Mackey, etc. Um, piano, Beethoven, Chopin, those are easily my favorites. Uh, same with orchestra on the Beethoven front. I've recently been listening to Shostakovich, and he's pretty neat. But what I listen to most is uh, score, uh, specifically video game score. Um, the Legend of Zelda easy just easy but recently i've been playing more stuff and branching out a little bit more um toby fox feels like an obvious answer when it comes to favorite pieces but i finally played hollow knight Ooh, and those are some when, of my favorite video game pieces by far yes when i first heard christopher larkin score uh green path at hornet are my two favorite tracks yep um what came to mind was i want this is what i want to write um and then baldur's gate 3 had its full release and borislav slavov's work on baldur's gate 3 is also just incredible stuff and cassie and i have been watching a lot more ghibli movies and i've fallen completely in love with joe hisiashi just all stuff kind of within that vein if it sounds even remotely like any of those composers i will probably like it and it will probably be my favorite piece of music all right um next what were so we've talked a lot about skills that have been helpful in the world of music but what about going the other way around what have been some skills that you developed in the world of music that have been helpful outside of that world for you Ooh, patience um I should note, I've gotten a lot of my patients from working in the food industry, but... God rest your soul. Yeah. Um, you can develop a lot of patients just based off of how you practice, because practice should not be rushed through. It should be slow. It should be methodical. And that is something that I still struggle with. But once you can wrap your head around that, take things just a little bit slower, it really just bleeds into your everyday life. Mm -hmm. absolutely i 100 percent agree with you there patience i feel like has been a just an amazing skill to develop and anything that can get someone to be more patient like whatever works great just anything that can do that so yes and also compassion because you're up there a lot you're performing a lot when you see other people's perform it becomes less of an expectation and more of like a right of solidarity. Um, and it just, it really helps you get closer to people. Mm -hmm. I absolutely agree with you. So finally, any last pieces of advice for our aspiring musicians and composers? Man, just do it. Like, again, for the longest time, I have been saying that I will never write music. I'm not good at it. But I never tried. I never knew if I'd be good at it. I've been composing for a year now. Uh, I had my first piece premiered, the, the Shadow of Mercy, in a concert in February 2023. Um, and it has been a journey that has led me all the way to switching my music major from general music to music composition. It is what I do now. I am, people in the halls know me as a composer, and I've been doing this for just about a year. So just try it. 
Whatever it is, just do it. Mm-hmm. You saying that reminded me of remind me of something. So there's a little thing I like to read every morning. I just wanted to pull a little excerpt from that, where it's uh, in the end, it's what you do that counts. So try your best, forgive yourself when you make mistakes, learn from them, and try again. The only way to fail is if you quit. So long as you don't exactly. quit, you can't fail. Yes, that is that is a very good quote and one that people should definitely live by. You only fail if you stop. If you can keep getting back up, if you can keep brushing yourself off, and if you keep saying, no, I can do this, you will. Mm -hmm. The three options are to quit, which is what most people will do, to succeed, or to die trying. Exactly. And most people never even get those options, because most of them will never even start to begin with. So, John, is there anything that you want to plug? If people want to listen to more of your music, and I think we'll have something, we'll have one thing play at the end here, but where can people go to listen to listen to your stuff, hear about you, what you do? Oh, yeah. Um, I have a website, uh, www.jonathanerickson.com. Um, I update that website when I put out new pieces. Um I, it links to my YouTube pretty directly. I have YouTube previews on the website, so you can go there and listen to it as well. Um, and I sell my music on there uh, through Arrange Me, all done 100% through my uh, site, or everything comes together at that site. Um, but yeah, uh, listen to my music on YouTube, buy music on my site. Those are the two big plugs that I can think of. All right. And then is for me, is there anything that you is there any one song that you want played at the end here that people can listen to to get a good grasp of oh, this is some of his stuff? Ooh. Um I think I want to name three pieces uh that people can go and listen to and then I'll say one that I think you definitely should plug. Um those three pieces are going to be uh, Montesian Festival. That is one that I just kind of started without an idea, and I wanted to see where it, uh, what it became. Um, uh, the Emissary of Hope is the one that everybody sounds like a uh, Zelda piece, and one that I'm very proud of, especially the third movement uh, near the end. There's a little guitar cadenza. Um, that I just absolutely loved uh, writing. And uh, Return Me Home to Frost Laden Trees is the first time that I really tried to make something not based off of a programmatic idea, such as a D&D character or an event, but rather more like my actual emotion and how something makes me feel. Um, I'm working currently on a fully orchestrated version of that. I've put down a piano version in the interim. Um, I know I said that I'd have you choose one, uh, but yeah, I guess either the third movement of the Emissary of Hope or uh, Frost Laden Trees would be uh, probably the best looks into what I'm doing right now. Actually, because we've talked about it so much, Mind if I uh, plug in the excerpt from The Shadow of Mercy just to give people a good glance of this is where he started, and then if they want to see where you've grown from there, they can go and do that? Yeah, that also works. Um, if you'd like, I can also send you a snippet from the rewrite of The Shadow of Mercy I've been doing. How about we do that one instead? So, with that, John, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on here. I love talking with you about music. I feel like it's something we don't do nearly enough. Yeah, it definitely isn't, is it? Yeah. So with all that said, uh, thanks for coming on. Yeah, it's no problem. Thanks for having me. And without further ado, an excerpt from The Shadow of Mercy by John Erickson.
if you enjoy this episode of Cast of All Trades, I have three super easy things I'd like you to do that would mean the world to me. One, subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss our next episode. Two, while you're in your podcast app of choice, give the show a five-star review. It helps us reach more people and in turn helps us change lives through generalism. And three, share this episode with a friend or two, someone you think will gain a lot from this show. Word of mouth is the best way to help a podcast grow. And if your friend likes the show, they'll thank you for introducing them to it. It's a win-win. And one last thing before I go, John sent over his latest composition for me to share with all of you. So with all that said, best of luck, tradesmen, and I'll talk to you all later. Now, Return Me Home to Frost Laden Trees by John Erickson.